So just to take a step back from what I'm going to talk about, and the idea really here is just to share information. Um, after my 26 years in the elevator business, a lot of it in modernization and renovation, a lot of it in the western United States, a lot of it even in one market where I've got to see the same buildings uh, change tenants, change owners multiple times where I still do the work in that same building. Uh, and we've done a lot of innovation in San Francisco. We'll talk about that. The idea is to share the experience uh, from what we've done, largely in San Francisco, but also with other things, um, really for the benefit of the folks here that are designing buildings. And uh, with um, not just a professional intent, but with a personal intent to actually try to make some type of difference in how elevators work in buildings. And I'll tell you candidly that there is enormous opportunity to design better buildings of all heights with elevators, saving space, making them more, more efficient, making them work better. Uh, and this is, the, as we're going to talk about, this is actually the largest elevator market in the world. So just trying to really provide ideas to designers and owners for things that could work here in uh, China. I also picked up the um, theme from the vice mayor of Shanghai, uh, which I, I related to and was very much uh, the underpinning of what I want to talk about today which was innovation, sustainability, and I think he called it humanity. Um, uh, I put it in as humaneness. I'm not sure if that's a word. I'm going to go through some pictures here real quick. These are just to sort of absorb, and you can see if they make any sense. This is Houston about a month ago. Kelly and I were in the airport getting a flight, and I uh, just thought this was interesting. Um, and then this was yesterday. That's my phone. And this is my hotel that I'm staying in here in Shanghai. And then that is a picture of a fixture that I think is very nice, that does all sorts of things. That's a hall fixture that actually is, uh, I don't know, maybe 70 meters from here or something in Kone's booth. And if I need to explain the connection between those, then we can talk later. All right. so. Why even talk about any of this? Um, that's the biggest elevator market in history. That's an incredible number. Uh, in the US, I think we're doing less than 20,000 units a year. China's doing uh, almost half a million units a year. So for the elevator companies, it's, a, it's an incredible market. They're the biggest elevator factories in the world being built here. And they're basically building uh, an urban environment. Now, that's what we're sort of meeting about here. Uh, it's, the, it's the most construction that anybody's ever seen in buildings that have elevators. So it's worth talking about. This 60% of the global market. 70% um, of it, which we don't really talk about very much here at the conference, but is very relevant, is where these people are all going to live that are coming really for second and third tier cities. And I assume other areas around places like Shanghai that are considered first tier. And, and these are the volume uh, numbers. So, you know, this is something like 250,000 elevators a year just in this segment alone. We won't talk about this a lot, but there's, there is trickle down technology. So, things that you might do in your very tall, you know, more attractive Class A buildings or fancy hotels or residential buildings will eventually show up as features in these kind of buildings down the road. But there's enormous potential to do these kind of buildings better in China. Uh, the segment that we all tend to work in, at least for this market, would tend to be more here in the office and retail. And then there's a pretty big segment with transit and airports and then other types of buildings. And as I understand it from the people here who know a lot better than I do, uh, it's the second and tier, third tier cities that are really now just going under massive, massive construction. Things are happening really fast. And the implication of that is that the elevators get bought really fast. And I suspect if I was designing buildings here, uh, I'd very, be under a lot of pressure to knock out a design quick and get on to the next one and get under construction fast if I'm the contractor. And so what's happening is the opportunity for innovation is being lost. Uh, and, and the elevator companies, if I'm an elevator company, which I'm not anymore, but I'm in the industry, there's a big motivation to sell. This is a seller's market. Uh, you show up and you're taking orders and you're making a lot of money. And if the customer's not pushing you to innovate, don't even bring up any crazy questions, just sell them a bunch of elevators and move on to the next one. But there's a huge opportunity here for innovation. Um, I look around uh, Shanghai here and I see Jin Mao and I see uh, the Shanghai Tower, I see uh, Shanghai World Financial, I see some of those beautiful buildings in the world. And then I think of the place that I know best. I'm from New York City originally. I grew up when the uh, World Trade Towers were coming up. Um, and Steve Edgett, in fact, has worked on this project. Uh, the whole World Trade Center project, in fact, is all destination elevators. And it was designed years ago at this point. 
probably was being all laid out in 2002 and 2003 in terms of the elevator design, but none of the projects around here that I see are destination. So um, we, we're, we've lost as an industry a big opportunity to be more innovative. Uh, and even in the broader market, if I understand correctly, uh, MRLs, the very efficient ones with full regen uh, on the smaller volume also are not really being selected with any sort of uh, push or desire in their design to make them more space or energy efficient. It's really being, they're being bought as a commodity, largely. Obviously, there's probably a certain segment of the market that's sophisticated, but right now, uh, the elevator systems we're going in in China are really based upon, let's say, 10 and 15-year-old technologies for the volume market. And I would say 10 years behind for the super uh, sexy stuff as well in terms of what could be done with uh, some of the new ways of interfacing uh, people with elevators and dispatching. So what are the, how do we become more innovative? Well, I think the industry needs to do a better job communicating. Uh, it's been confusing. There's all these different dispatch systems. Is it full destination? Is it hybrid? You know, how does it all work? And uh, what are the terms? And with, the, with everybody competing, there's been a tendency for the message to get lost about some very basic things. And I think Jim Fortune is going to talk about some of this destination in more detail. But there's an opportunity uh, to, for the industry to do a better job of trying to communicate what it has now that's better sort of like the beginning of the light bulb. Uh, everybody, one guy screws it in this way, one guy screws it in that way, and another guy says, you gotta do this with it, and by the time the customer's done, he's all confused, and he just says, when you guys figure it out, let me know. Um, th this is a, the big opportunity for anybody who wants to, I think, have more creativity in vertical transportation design, and that's to get in with the elevator contractor a lot earlier, with the architect and the owner and the building team, to actually start asking questions. How could we you know, use elevators as a way to make the building better? And if I'm understanding from talking to people here, that tends to happen. That discussion doesn't happen that often. And when it does happen, it's often too late to do anything about it. Uh, I think there's a similar education path with the owner, obviously, to show them the big benefits they could be getting. Uh, owners don't like to, uh, or developers don't like to leave money on the table or uh, do things uh, in a less efficient way than they need to. And then there's opportunities with the government and with codes, and some of that probably will be coming eventually. Okay, I'm gonna pick it up here a little bit. Um, I think most people here are probably pretty familiar with this, but these are all the sort of levers that you can pull with making elevator systems more efficient uh, on the architecture and space and how people move and on the big carbon footprint issues of elevator costs, building costs, things that are initial, uh, initial impacts, things that are over the life of the project, and then even things we don't talk about, which is where does the equipment come from and what's the carbon footprint of the place that made it and what are we going to do with it when we tear it down. Uh, the, probably the biggest cost to the users in the building is their time. We don't do a lot of discussion of what that time is worth, but the people in the building will tell you, and they might even have some uh, validity to this, is to say actually that's the most important thing of all and probably the most valuable. And, and then the basic practical issues of operating the building well, moving goods and people, um, you know, being able to do construction in the building, keeping passengers safe, obviously keeping the owner of the building, whoever that might be, and the people in the building happy. And uh, I think for most of the projects that, uh, that a lot of us get involved in, that the asset issue is sort of underpinning everything, that there has to be some responsible, effective, knowledgeable asset management. So I'm going to hit these things pretty quick. And at, when I was putting this together, I realized I had way too much information. So I'm going to focus mostly on destination dispatch. And maybe for the people who have attended the vertical transportation sessions, um, there's been six presentations, I think. Five are on, have basically either been entirely about destination or are almost all about destination. So the message from a whole bunch of people who actually don't see each other all that often and actually compete with each other in many ways, whether they're contractors or consultants, we're sort of coming out with a uniform message that this destination dispatch thing has a lot to offer. And then we'll talk about some things that we've experienced with integrating elevators and dis destination dispatch with security, uh, some energy things and some equipment spaces. But I'm going to really pass through these pretty quick. We're going to spend most of the time here. Uh, this is where I work, as I mentioned before. Uh, I'm in a strange situation in my life. I'm now 52 where I walk down the street there. I run into elevator mechanics. Uh, I know the elevators in all the buildings. I know who maintains them. I know what kind of door operator they have. It's a strange thing, but I've, I've sort of you know, I've got enough of my life in that city that it's been interesting to see how it works, what works, and what doesn't. Um, to give you the flavor of the Bay Area, not that we've done projects for all these people, but we've done projects for the buildings of a lot of these people. And the interesting ones are the ones of the companies that aren't there that are coming up that are eventually going to be there. 
but we, we're in a strange market because we're very heavily funded by the global financial markets because people want to throw money into innovation. A lot of that's in Northern California. It kind of starts with the big universities, with Cal and with Stanford, and then you've got these old line companies like Intel, HP, and National Semiconductor, and then some of these other major players obviously here. But whether it's for these companies or the bankers or the legal firms or the other people that support them, that's basically who we're working for in the Bay Area. It's a mature market. Um, San Francisco hasn't wanted a lot of new construction for years. The economy's not that strong anyway, but that really wouldn't be the reason in San Francisco. There's an economy there to build new buildings. The city hasn't wanted new buildings. They were afraid of the Manhattanization of the city, so we've been sort of recycling our buildings now for a while. So most of what happens with fun elevator stuff in the high-rise buildings is really in the modernization business, where we take buildings that already exist and we reconfigure them and find ways to make them better. And where the owner is very focused on how do you take this asset I've got and make it work better so I can keep my tenants happy. Sometimes retain tenants who want to move out, but half the work we do downtown is just for that reason. Um, and and other, many times it's how can you make it more efficient and I want to get the rents up. So a lot of it is very much about making the buildings work better, sort of where the rubber meets the road. Uh, in our market, some manufacturers are stronger than others, but I'll tell you that we work with all the major companies. So we've done destination projects now with Schindler, Otis, Kone, Tyson, Mitsubishi, um, and so when I'm talking about this, we're talking about working with all the companies. In what's considered in the elevator industry possibly the most interesting elevator market in the world right now because of all this innovation that has been going on. I'm just going to go through the list of projects real quick. These are the projects that we've been involved in. Steve was involved in some of these as well. The red ones are ones that my company was involved in or I was involved in uh, when I worked with Steve at Edge Williams. Uh, well, we were you know, doing two-thirds of these fun jobs. A lot of the red ones, I'm, I'm happy about that. And then as we get to the more recent ones, because these are in chronological order, we're not doing as many of them. The reality is that we have a lot of competitors that are now doing them. So it took a while, and now the other consultants are also pushing a lot of these new ideas. So that's an incredible number of destination projects for a fairly uh, small downtown. And here's uh, probably we do more work for owners than we do really for architects on these kind of projects, so, which, which I think is fine because the owners, you know, they pay well. They take care of you. They're long term. And uh, they're really into where the rubber meets the road. And if you're modernizing buildings, the tenants are there. If you do something wrong, everybody knows immediately. If you do something right, you get positive feedback. So there's a real tangible connection between how the money comes into the building and how the building works uh, and the elevator system. And a lot of these buildings that we've modernized have been sold, and that was always a concern. Well, how are they going to do when they go to sell the building? Some of them have been sold twice, and they do extremely well. These are just some quotes, and these are verbatim quotes. If anybody wanted to talk to actual customers, I'm happy to give all sorts of references for this. And I'm not trying to actually sell work that we've done. I'm trying to give the idea that there's better ways to do elevators for anybody here that wants to get involved in this. Uh, for a major tenant, one of the biggest employers in downtown San Francisco was going to move out of a building. Did all this destination stuff. They paid for half of the project, and it was pretty complicated. Uh, I just asked the owner recently, well, are they happy? And the answer was, the word he used was ecstatic. I have another uh, major owner that says that they won't ever do another project with conventional elevators. That's a very common uh, statement. And then um, this, this last one's the, the most interesting. Um, that's from a very, very, very senior executive at one of the biggest elevator companies in the world after a meeting in San Francisco with the customer of his competitor, okay? Coming away with saying, wow, they really like their elevators. Um, when we're doing work in other cities too, so we're starting to get more active here, um, and we're, we're obviously also starting to do a little bit more work in Asia. Uh, this is for the project in Denver. It got some pretty good positive press. Um, so what we talk about with destination elevators a lot is that it moves people better. We've sort of beaten that to death. We haven't been that clear about how it moves people better, and we've debated a lot in the industry about what that means, but that's sort of well understood. I'll talk about that a little bit. <laughs> Um, this is a project in Chicago. This is a building where, for the elevator folks that know and the people that pay attention to this kind of stuff, we, we normally want to be at a number somewhere between like 9 and 16 percent of how many people uh, come in the building every uh, five minutes as a percentage of the total population. This is four or five, and the reason is that this is one six-car uh, group of elevators in a building that in meters would be like 120,000 square meters. So it's a short, fat building was actually a meeting building or a convention center before it was an office building, and it has like 26 escalators. So we're just trying to get people to move into the elevators because nobody wants to take an escalator eight floors up to go to their office. 
So we're doing a lot of different things here. Part of it's destination, part of it is taking elevators that we can bring into the passenger group that are being used as service cars, but these numbers are incredible. Um, and this was presented, uh, Schindler actually did these numbers here, but I came up with numbers that were pretty much comparable. We are adding elevators into the group here. We're going really from four to five or four to six, but um, this is an owner I've worked for for about 20 years. And if I didn't feel comfortable with these kind of numbers, then I, I wouldn't be presenting them. But we've, we've had pretty good results. Again, there's more going on here than just pure destination, but destination gives us an ability to put cars into work that we couldn't do before. So it's about getting more capacity, but also about other things that allow you to be more flexible in terms of control. And maybe flexibility is one of the main themes of this, the ability to be dynamic and flexible about how people move in the building uh, and about how the building uh, changes over time and how our world changes over time. So other things it does better well. Um, if we could just play this, this is very quick, so just watch close. We may play it twice. I, I was actually emailed this about four or five days ago. So this is very recent. It's just a guy getting into an elevator. Um, and this is in the Westin St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco. Now this is listed, those five elevators are listed, whether it's right or not, in National Geographic's website. You can go look at it if it's not blocked here. Uh, it's the number three elevator ride in the world. Okay, that's those five elevators. And one of the problems here is that um, there's a lot of tourists that come in. So if you go to Yelp and you look at what to do in San Francisco, you'll find one of the most popular things for tourists to do is to go ride these elevators. So when I say that something better is happening here, I'll be very clear about it. Um, this is a five car wide group. As anybody knows that's staying in one of these buildings around here that typically has a four car wide group, you often can't get to the farthest elevator, just too far away. You, you see the doors open, but you can't get there because your shoes don't have the traction or you don't want to run. So since that door time, you know, might, there might not be enough door time to get there, so you let it go. In, in this kind of system, um, if we can put the picture up again, just, uh, just the video. Anyway, I'll explain it when it comes back up. But there's five cars in line. That's a fairly big walking distance. With the destination system, it actually knows where you're standing at which keypad, and so it can send you the right car and have the elevator waiting there for you, like it does for him in this case and it actually times the walking distance. So that's one of the intelligent ways to set these systems up and obviously the way that they're supposed to work. There's also big columns between the elevators, so if a person was standing at the vantage point that we have, nobody would ever go to the last elevator because they didn't even know it was there. So we put a big wayfinding sign in it, real bright, so that people, we'd actually be able to use all the elevators uh, there in the hotel. And they had big problems with long waits. Um, in fact, I summarized some of it here. So they had the problem with the um, tourists coming in the building. Um, We've got much better uh, calculation of the walking distance and door times, much better wayfinding to get the elevators at the ends. And then the last problem we had is that people would take in the view. So these are glass elevators. You get a great view of San Francisco. They're outside, so it rains on top of the elevators. They're not, there's no glass shaft. It's a great ride, fast cars. Um, okay, thanks. Um, the uh, people would be looking at the view of San Francisco, and they would back up against all the buttons in the car. And so the elevator ended up making a lot of extra stops. So taking the buttons out of the car had an unintended positive consequence. Those are the kind of things that have come out. That's just one example. Those are the kind of things that work a lot better with an elevator system with destination. A lot of this you've heard before. I'm just going to touch this real quick. Um, the people that benefit most from these reduced trip times are the people in the highest part of the building, or at least the highest elevators in the building. Okay, that's something we don't talk about a lot. Sometimes if they're very high up, they're paying the most. So we want to keep them happy. Um, the handling capacity thing, we always talk about in this theoretical way about, you know, it's a number and how many people does it move, but sometimes you just need more capacity because one of your elevators is shut down or something else is happening in the building or the use of your building is not what you thought it would be. Oh, I don't need destination, my traffic is fine. Well, who knows what your, destiny, your density is going to be in five or ten years. And I'll tell you this as a guy who has been involved in buying a lot of these systems, um, maybe the elevator guys won't want to hear this, but probably the first you know, five or six projects we did, they were free. People, the elevator companies wanted to get in the market. I don't think anybody here that's looking to do a major project with destination would be out of line of saying, if I'm gonna be your pilot project and you're gonna figure all this out for my building, I wanna get a concession on what I'm paying for this. Now, the, that's me, I'm a consultant, not an elevator contractor, so nobody's offering you that, but I'm saying that that's something that I've experienced a lot. Also, the first buildings that we did, uh, we um, had agreed to tear the systems out if they didn't work and we never tore anything out, nobody ever asked us to. I'm gonna skip all this stuff, except I'm gonna just hit right the main one here. Um, 
This is an easier to use system than a conventional elevator system, period. Uh, you, you enter in your destination once from the hall, you go to the elevator and you're done. You don't have to put in the direction and then figure out which car you're going to go to and then get in and then push a car and reach around somebody. It works better. Um, I would say that if you are going to do a project like this, you should make sure that you're working with a good elevator company, maybe a consultant. I don't, I'm not saying you need a consultant. You, if you work with a very good elevator company, you probably don't, um, depending on how complicated your building is. I'm thinking about a normal building, not a very exotic building. But I, I would suggest don't jump into one of these and just start you know, approving everything without really understanding how it works and making sure that you've sort of measured twice and cut once or maybe measured three times. Um, and, and the point of this is that there's a lot of work involved. That's that same group of elevators. This is also only about a week ago. Uh, I, I was in Japan, actually, when this was taken. But um, this is the team that worked on this project. Actually, it's only about half the team. And this, this ended up being a pretty tricky project uh, with all sorts of special requirements and interfaces. But it, it, it's going to be very good. This is a hotel I stayed in in Tokyo last week. Um, pretty complicated elevator system. It's an eight-car group. Looks like this. These are low rise, these are high rise, and only these cars serve the parking garage. And they have a major baseball stadium right next door. And they have all sorts of interesting things going on. This is actually tailor made for destination. Um, very complicated. Um, I, I'm assuming everybody's absorbed all this, so I'll keep going. <laughs> Uh, this is a complicated building uh, where destination applies, I would say, about as complicated as they get. Uh, I, I've got a term I call asymmetry in the floor service, and this one has a lot of that. One group, two group, three group, all the cars don't go out of the same floors, and very tricky. Destination actually works fine with that. A conventional system does not work well with that. And when I say does not work well, I'm being nice. Uh, let's run this, if you can. So this was put together by a company. Uh, San Francisco oh. is being looked at by the Department of State Architects Office and the Department of Justice Access Board. Uh, that's how good our standards are here in San Francisco. Do you want to see? Please. OK, right. so I'm going to push the access key, which is going to activate the I can't the pause voice. it, but we're, we're not in order. Destination floor. I'm going to go to floor 24. 24. Proceed to call oh. J. To the left. Let's go. And okay. Jay and then Juliet has arrived. Um, all right. So I'm going to go to the other building in a second. That was Jessie Lorenz, and she is an um, uh, activist, blind from birth, uh, who we worked on for some new regulations for San Francisco. Uh, and I think I've lost those. Oh, there we go. So there's the slides related to Jessie. Um, this is a system that works very good for people with disabilities. This is where the humaneness part of that theme that the vice mayor mentioned comes in. And if there's any good reason to, be, to want to do this, this is really the right reason. And I do fundamentally believe that uh, a more inclusive society is a good thing. It's the direction we're going in. Um, the elevator system is probably the most important accessible system in a building. Uh, just getting up in the building if you have multiple floors is a big deal. And the reason this works well is that there's an individual interface with the, with the uh, user. So Jesse's, um, uh, Jesse was very involved in running some regulations for San Francisco for Destination and is a, obviously a big proponent of it. Um, there's a real need to be able to do this better, though. This whole uh, way that we serve people with disabilities in elevators can be done a lot better. And I think Destination Dispatch, at least I'm convinced, and uh, the, the, dis the disabled community in San Francisco is convinced that this is the solution. Okay, um, and in fact, we have a special regulation in San Francisco. We were all very involved in writing it, and, and this is interesting. We have a requirement that um, if whatever keypad you go to, you get the elevator that's next to you. So rather than having to find the accessible elevator and only be able to use one elevator, you have the same access as anybody else, but you get the benefit if you're blind and if you want it to have the car come to you that's next to where you are. So when we went with the blind community in California, that was their, the main thing they were asking for is, can you give us an elevator that we can get to? Because when it's three elevators here and three there, how can I hear the one that's making this dinging sound that's two over uh, to the left behind me? It's pretty hard to do. So this is a requirement in San Francisco. You push the accessible function key, you get the elevator that's next to you. Um, and we did a lot of work on this, and we got a nice little uh, uh, acknowledgement from the city of San Francisco. OK, I'm going to go through this quick. Uh, I did miss, though. Well, maybe it's coming up. We want to watch video three here. Um, a lot of discussion about how elevators work with security. And security is also, I think, overall a good thing. People know very, if security done well, people like to be in a secure place. There are reasons why we need to sort of be able to control the buildings where people can go. 
the, the key is this, uh, and this is my language. The elevator system is a much more complicated system than the building security system. But the elevator system needs to take orders from the building security system. So maybe as a takeaway, just think about that. Um, and this is all computer driven. So whoever your elevator company is and whoever your security company is, they need to have some software to be able to talk to each other and it can get pretty tricky. So that's a discussion you want to have before you buy all this stuff if you want it to work well, is how that, how's that going to work? And the future is basically this, and we've done a lot of this and it works great, which is to control every passenger to any floor, from any floor, okay? And you can do it based on time of day, on an individual passenger basis. This is what one security system, a company set up for how they do destination for um, some of the major manufacturers. This is how it's done with Schindler. Schindler has some patents on how security is integrated with their elevator, so it makes it a little bit different. This is an access chart, actually, for the building where I have my office, and uh, it describes um, who can go where from what floor. And you have six different options, whether it's open, it's closed, need a card, need a card and a code, need a code only, need a card only. We didn't make it that complicated. We didn't use all these colors. But um, this, this, uh, this works extremely well and has a side benefit of making the elevators run better too because now everybody's not just going everywhere. This is in San Francisco where you actually use your driver's license to get in the building. You show up as a visitor. If I go to visit Steve, he puts me in the system. Then I show up with my driver's license and it tells me what elevator to go to. It's all automated. Here's an article about the building we actually did where Yahoo is the tenant. Uh, and I'm going to go through the rest of this quick. I think I'm running out of time here. Um, other people will touch on this. This is another presentation, I think, for another day, all the energy stuff. We missed one. I'd like to show one thing, which is the video three. And then I'm going to close up. So I want to give credit to a company in the UK called SDG. They actually did this, but the dispatching information came from Otis. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to jump off the stage. Um, this is an existing building where there's a lot of traffic over here. You can see all these dots. These dots represent people. The colors represent the part of the building they're going to in terms of where they are, in terms of the floors. And this is a very busy group of elevators where there might be 16 people getting into a 1,000 kg elevator in a very nice building. Um, the idea here is that if you coordinate this well with the security system, you can actually get the people that are going to the same part of the building to use the elevators. Now, there's obviously other floor groups here, but these guys are all going up here, which I think in this building is like the 20th floor. And then um, the way it works now, everybody's just going with everybody. It's a big mess. Anyway, this, this graphically depicts it kind of nicely. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip the rest of this because I think I'm running out of time. I don't want to impinge on anybody else's time. Let me, here's the recommendation. Um, if you want to take advantage of this stuff, there's an opportunity for building designers to gain competitive advantage, okay, and for owners. This stuff is coming. Might as well learn it now. Be first. First projects might be a little bit more trying. But once you start to do this, now you have something to sell as part of what you're offering to the people that you're working for. So that would be the recommendation. And to work closely with the elevator companies on this. Find a good company. Uh, maybe find a consultant. There's a whole bunch of very good people here. Uh, and I would be happy to point out all the people, a lot of them are my competitors, who they are to anybody who's interested, because I'd like to see some of these good ideas get adopted here in this incredibly large market. So um, thank you for your time, and um, good luck with that. <laughs>